Thank you. That's Rachel and Pam. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, turn them over to the book of Habakkuk. Now that's not in the concordance. That's in the Old Testament. Habakkuk chapter 3. Be looking at verses 1 and 2. Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Speaking on the subject this morning of Habakkuk's prayer for revival. As I said to you a few weeks ago in a message, that the people came to the prophet and said, Do you have a word from God? Does God have a word for us? And that is the reason that people come to church is to worship God and to know that they have a, heard a word from Him. <coughs> we hear about all the things in the world going on in the news and, uh, and things like that. But when we come to church, we want to know, has God have any, has, does He have anything to say to me? Verse 1 in Habakkuk says, A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, Upon Shignoth, O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years, in the midst of the years make known, in wrath remember mercy. One of the greatest needs, don't you listen to me now, one of the greatest needs in America today is revival. It's not trying to balance a budget, even though that is important. It's not electing a person to be president, although, although that is important. But the greatest need in the land that you and I love is revival. And I'll show you in a moment why I'm saying that. Now this message that I said is taken out of the first two verses of Habakkuk. Chapter 3. What is the prophet afraid of when he says, Oh Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. Well he was referring to to the judgments of God upon Israel. And just as the writer Hebrew writes, he says it is fearful, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a, the living God in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31. And as I read that, folks, it is a fearful thing for us to fall into the hands of the living God. The prophet is referring to the destruction of Israel, the northern kingdom of Samaria in 722 B.C. by the Assyrians. And he is also referring to the destruction of Jerusalem and Judah by the Babylonians in 587 B.C. Now Habakkuk lived in between these two events. Now the first destruction has already come to pass. And Habakkuk himself was the messenger of God to announce the second judgment to his people. That is why he says, when he, when he realized, <clears throat> excuse me, what God was saying to him, he says, O oh Lord, I have heard thy speech and, and was afraid. He feared the judgment of God that the Lord sent him to announce against his own people and against his city. We read in the first chapter of Habakkuk, the Lord's warning on the 
concerning the coming of the Chaldean captivity that the prophet himself was to call upon to deliver. <clears throat> the first thing, I want to look at Habakkuk in this uh, passage of Scripture. And the first thing that I see is Habakkuk's question and the Lord's answer. Now when God told Habakkuk what he, what he wanted him to tell his people and the city, I mean it scared him. He was fearful. <clears throat> and so he asked a question of the Lord when he sent him to announce to his own people that they would be destroyed by the Babylonians and taken into captivity. And he asked, Lord, however evil and wicked we may be, we are not more evil and wicked than the Babylonians. Why do you allow them to destroy us? <clears throat> and then he goes on and says, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and cast not look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devour the man <clears throat> that is more righteous than he? And the answer comes from God in verse 12. He says, O Lord, <coughs> thou hast ordained them for judgment. <clears throat> and O mighty God, thou hast established them for correction. In verse 12 of chapter 1. And Isaiah declared, O Assyrians, the rod of mine anger, and the staff in their hands in my indignation. And in Isaiah chapter 10, verse 5. And what God is saying for Habakkuk to announce, folks, is the same message that America needs today. Now listen to me as I talk about this. We cannot continue, folks, to support same-sex marriages gays, homosexuals, allowing them to adopt, uh, to adopt children, drunkenness, blasphemy. That's the question of the Lord's day. We cannot continue to support and not face the inevitable judgment of the Almighty God. Now, I sat in my office in there a moment ago, and I know it's not going to be popular, but I'm going to tell you what God has said. God is not going to put up with America doing what it's doing today and not do something about it. He destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because of the same things that are going on in America today. He destroyed them. And folks, it's not inevitable that he won't destroy us. <coughs> Many have been so indoctrinated with the don't offend anyone philosophy that even many Christians are afraid to speak up against moral and spiritual wrongs. What thinking is, that thinking is not biblical. Christians, we should stand up and speak out on the issues of our time. Nowhere in the Bible we are told to tolerate sin and be quiet and allow it to continue unopposed. And if somebody don't speak out, you say, well, Jackie, you're here in, in Fairview Baptist Church in a little town called, named Newburn. Well, I'm going to tell you, it can start right here. You've got to have some backbone about you. You've got to have some, it's not good saying, but you've got to have some guts to stand up and say, look, my God is not going to put up with what's going on in America today. Abortion. I'm going to tell you what's so, folks, you may not believe it, but abortion is murder. Amen. What I was reading there just a minute ago was not mine. I, I, I got it out of a magazine. We have a government today that recognizes religion, uh, pagan religions more than Christianity. And what was this nation founded upon? It was founded upon Christianity. It was founded upon believing in God. And I was thinking a moment ago that if the founders of this nation could know what's going on in this nation today, they would turn over in their graves. Now listen to this. The Lord will raise up even these bitter, atheistic countries to chasten us. 
China is one that comes to my mind. Now, it's hard for us to realize that America could be lost, that our nation could be destroyed, and that we could be, uh, that we could be confronted by ruthless enemies, but that is in the hands of an almighty God. And folks, whether we live or die in this is the sovereign judgment of the judge of all nations, which is the Almighty God. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. If we continue on the road we're running right now, we're going to be destroyed. He, he told Rebecca, he says, you go back to your people and you tell them what I'm telling you. And he was telling them that he's going to destroy them. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. If God destroyed them, because of what they were doing, he'll destroy us because of what we're doing. I thought that'd get an amen sure enough, Brother Jerry. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother. Then secondly, listen to Habakkuk's prayer. The, the prophet gave himself to the one resource that is possible for us. He, he prayed. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known. In wrath, remember mercy. In verse 2. Listen, revival can save a nation. It saved Judah in the days of Hezekiah. It saved England in the days of John and Charles Wesley. A revival can save a city. It saved Nineveh uh, in the days of Jonah. It saved Antioch in the days of John Christendom. It saved, it, it saved uh, 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 it's Florence Italy in the days of Savannah Roland. Revival can save a home. It can, it can save a life. It did yesterday. It does today. And it will forever. We need revival, folks, in our churches, in our homes, in our nation. And when we see revival, folks, you will see a nation that turned upside down for the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will see a different nation than you see today. Then third, what is revival? Listen to this. Revival is a Christian word. It's, it's, it's a family word. The lost are not revived. They are dead in trespasses and sin. They need to be resurrected. They need to be born again. It is a word for Christian people. The family of God needs to be revived. I remember when I was a boy, and that had been too many years ago, when I was a boy, they ran two weeks of revivals. Lord have mercy, help us we did that today. But two weeks. The first week the preacher preached and, uh, to get the saved folks, the Christians revived. And then the second week was for the lost to be saved because the Christians got revived. And they went out there and talked to the lost about Jesus. And they came in. And then they had revival. I'll never forget one time I was up in western Kentucky in revival. And I had preached Monday night not any decisions at all. Tuesday night not any decisions at all. Wednesday night not one decision. Now, this was the week of Halloween. Matter of fact, Halloween day was on Thursday. I preached Thursday night. I gave a revival and not a move. Not one move. I was a lot younger then than I am now, and I didn't have any more sense to do what I did. I just got over to the side of the pulpit, and I said, Folks, have you not heard what I said? If you want revival, get yourself down here in this altar and pray for God to move in this revival. Boy, they came down those aisles. They filled that altar full and people began to get saved. That's revival. And that's what America needs today. Revival is also a, a church word. It's an assembly word. Peter writes in the first uh, chapter, the first Peter chapter 4, verse 17, he says, for the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And folks, it's here. It must begin at the house of God. The church can never give what it does not possess. The first 
there, the first must be in the church, the presence of the Lord and the joy and the gladness that pertain in the bountiful graces of the living God. The overflowing, abounding presence of the Spirit of God. Let me tell you something, folks. The Spirit of God, if you don't believe it, is in this place. The Spirit of God is right here in this pulpit. I can't explain it to you. All I know is that he takes me and he uses me. And I know that he's here. I wish you saw that Sunday before last when eight or nine decisions were made uh, in this service. And I don't think it was hardly a dry eye in, in this place. The Spirit of God is moving. And folks, what we need to do when the Spirit of God moves upon us, say, here I am, Lord, send me. And you just watch what God's going to do with Fairview Baptist Church. He'll fill this place to capacity. Then fourthly, when does revival come? Revival comes when there is confession of sin. Revival comes when there is a, when believers are sob with sobbing hearts confess their sins. That's the beginning of real revival. You know what? There's not many real revivals going on in America today. I mean, there's some churches, and I hope you haven't been that way, but yeah, I'm not going to apologize. But there's some churches that the Holy Spirit of God will not even visit them unless it's the second week in August. That's the only time that the Holy Spirit can visit. And they have a, a revival, they call it revival, every year on the second week in August. It's not revival. Revival is when we confess our sins. Listen to Isaiah. In Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. Neither is ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Now, I know it's not easy to forsake sin. I, I know that it's not easy to deny the flesh. I know it's not easy to live a revived and victorious life. But we must confess our sins unto God, whose eyes are upon us, and our, and our open and naked souls before him, and God can help us to deny the flesh and overcome sins. Now, we can't do it ourselves without God. Also, we must pray with a burden for the lost. We must be a care, we must have care and be concerned whether people are saved or lost in our churches today. Visitation is almost nil in many of the churches today. Paul began in Romans 9 with this word. He said, I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself was accursed from, from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. In Romans chapter 9, verses 2 and 3. And he began in the 10th chapter of Romans the same way. He said, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God is for Israel that they might be saved. In Romans 10, 1. That should be our desire, folks. That we want to see people saved. That we want, that we want to see people come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. You say, well, Brother Jack, we pay you to do that. Well, let me tell you something. That's not what God does. God expects as much out of you as he does me. What I'm supposed to do is keep you straight. No, not really. <coughs> but it's all of our responsibility <coughs> to tell people about Jesus. Back when I was a member of South Fulton Baptist. To let us in the house. And we went out by twos, and my partner and I pulled over the side of the road there, and he said, let's pray that the next house we go to, that they'll let us see. And so we prayed. We cranked up and drove to this next house, knocked on the door. Sure enough, they let us in. And we talked to the mother and dad, and they said, yes, they were, they were Christians. They hadn't been doing what they really ought to be doing, and hadn't been in church like they ought to be, but they were Christians. And we, we prayed with them, and we started to go. And, it, and you may not believe this is what happened. I started toward the door, and there's a little girl about 12 or 13 years old sitting on the side over there. 
And I was going to the door, and it hit me. Jackie, say something to that young lady over there. And I turned to her, I said, young lady, are you a Christian? She says, no, but I want to be. I almost walked out of that room that night, out of that home, and not spoke to that little girl standing there. Folks, you may be around people all during the day, all during the week. Listen to God when he tells you to talk to somebody. Tell them about Jesus. It's not revival when we go through the days of the week and never think of the lost who are around us. And then fifthly, revival is the spirit of longing and hungering for God. True revival is accomplished by a hungering and a thirsting. Because listen to David in the book of Psalms. He says, O God, Thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land. And David also says in Psalm 42, 1, As the heart paineth after the water brooks, so paineth my soul after thee, O God. There is a profound meaning in that passage to those of us who have found the Lord. Let me ask you something. Have you drunk of the water of this life and still thirst? Have you found the emptiness of the rewards of the world? Is there still a longing in your heart for something more than the flesh and the world could afford? You will find it in God, my friend, not in the world. You will find it in God, not in the world. As I close, revival is the spirit of affirmation, response, and commitment. I'm going to challenge you to pray each day for revival to start in you. I'm going to start praying that it starts in me. Go throughout our county of Dyer County, throughout our state of Tennessee, and throughout our country, the United States of America. You say, well, Brother Jack, do you really think that a revival could start right here in the grassroots of Tennessee and spread out all across America? You better believe it. I believe it. It can start right here and go out all across the United States of America. This is America's greatest need. It's revival. As I look across this congregation, I don't see anyone that I know personally that's lost. But God taught me a long time ago that that's not your job, Jackie. That's the Holy Spirit's job and mine. You just preach what I put on your heart and mine, and we'll take care of the rest. Folks, I've told you, I've warned you what God said to be said. He told Rebecca, you go back to your people and you tell them what's going to happen. They don't turn. The Assyrians destroyed them. Babylonians took them into captivity. And folks, America is on the same road today. I hope you will commit to praying that. Every time you go to the Lord in prayer. And you watch revival break out right here. If you're here today and you know you're not, you do not know Christ as your personal Savior, I, I'm going to uh, invite you to come and give your life to Him. Just like I did many, many years ago. He'll reach down and he'll forgive you. And he'll say, anybody here needs new membership? I don't know. Won't you come make that decision today? Folks, something great is about to happen. Right here. I have, I've never shouted. Brother, I tell you, I'm just about ready to do that today. Something good is about to happen. Now, you better get on the wagon. And this is not good English, but you're going to get run over if you don't hang on. Because God is fixing the move right here. Let's pray. Father, thank you, God, for the power we felt in this pulpit this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your word. And Lord, let us hear what you had told Habakkuk. 
and the warning that you told him to announce to his people. <coughs> Lord, we know that you're saying the same thing to us today. In America, that is a, a country that was founded upon you, God, and upon Christianity. And it's walked just about as far away from you, Lord, as it can go. And I pray, Father, that the people here that's heard this message will take this message out into the area, wherever they might go, and tell people what God told us here today in this service. Help us, Lord, make that commitment to pray, God, that we would turn this country back over to you. Lord, if there's someone here today that's not saved, that's lost, and they've never given their life to Jesus, Holy Spirit, prick that heart, convict them of their sin, and point them to the cross at Calvary. Tell them that Jesus bled his life away, his precious blood, to wash away all of their sins. And Father, they may be a Christian here, a child of God, I don't know, uh, that needs to recommit their lives today. Say, Brother Jack, I'm coming to recommit my life to, to the Lord Jesus to do more for him uh, tomorrow than I did yesterday. Whatever decision, Lord, that be made, Holy Spirit, move upon the people. And we'll be careful to step back into the shadows of an empty cross, push Jesus to the forefront, and give him all the honor and the glory for it all. He's the only one worthy to receive it. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.